Okay. Everybody can hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, very good. So thank you for the introduction. Um, I will be very short and Mario will have to do the main part. <clears throat> um, I will just give you a quick overview of what that project is and um, what the state of affairs is and a very little glimpse into um, why we are doing that and what our product is. Mario, can you switch to the next slide? Okay, so um, what we intended to do is um, creating a Python SDK to implement OSLC APIs using the Python technology stack and uh, with, with more or less two things in scope. The one is a server-side SDK for creating um, OSLC providers and the other one being the client, a client-side SDK for creating using Python and um, <clears throat> A client side SDKs, uh, a client side SDK to to consume OSLC services using the Python programming language or the Python technology stack. The priority for us um, has so far been on the server side, um, but we will definitely do something for the client side too. And um, as Axel mentioned, um, there is something where we are funding um, open source development that is done by Connexus, um, being an OSLC specialist. And the reason we are doing that is um, um, to support or gain infrastructure and, and libraries and technology to support OSLC with our product. Um, that is called Contact Elements, uh, which is um, a kind of a modular PLM system. You will see in a minute a, a bit of it, um, but I will keep it very short. And if you want to know more, just um, you can reach me anywhere you find me on Twitter or on LinkedIn or um, also via email or something like that. And uh, But also you, you'll find um, more information on our website. And um, the more important thing um, where, where you can find PyOSLC, it's an open development model. We are um, being on our CS Lab um, organizational account on, on GitHub. So it's completely open source. It's um, open source licensed and you are free to do uh, whatever you want to do with it. And uh, Mario, can you switch to the next slide, please? Okay, to give you um, some of you, and I, I recognize some of your names because we introduced that product back in two, uh, that project back in 2018, I think, at um, the OSLC Fest. And um, we have been a little slow on that. So, um, and the reason being, so we have been developing on this more or less for the last two years, but um, we had some issues with um, the team being available in the way we wanted it. And we have um, done a lot of integration um, or interoperability testing. We have built a couple of working demonstrators with and without our product. <clears throat> and um, one of the things that um, is a lesson learned somehow and uh, Laurent mentioned that in, in his talk um, that we had um, a couple of issues um, when testing actual interoperability with, with other OSC tools. So we had to, in some cases, reverse engineer in, um, for not so standard implementations of um, other OSC supporting tools. So core and vocabularies are very robust. So that is very satisfying. Um, authentication, integration, and service advertising, not so much. So we have, um, yeah, we have learned a couple of lessons then. And um, early this year, we decided to change course a little bit. So, um, and we decided to rework the APIs um, to make the whole thing more framework-like and more easily usable. And uh, we have meanwhile an independent team, not the PIO SLC team, but an independent team at our product engineering group at Contact working on adopting PIO SLC with our standard product. So, um, that is the things that are going on. Mario, can you switch to the next slide, please? <clears throat> um, and so and, and to give you a very short glimpse of what we actually do with contact elements, that is kind of a, an, a set of building blocks for creating applications for industrial solutions. So there's a, there are a lot of core services from document management to workflow management to 3D visualization. So it's very product engineering focused and um, 
there are obviously many applications inside this thing that are interesting to be integrated with OSC into other tools, for example, um, something um, Andy mentioned in his um, talk about the IBM tool. So we have requirements inside our system, bill of material, obviously, and, and issue tracking and things like that. Uh, Mario, can you switch to the next question, uh, to the next slide? <clears throat> so, and um, from this, we derived a couple of, a set of requirements. So contact elements is heavily based on Python. That is something we, we provide our customers with source code actually. And um, everything is, in, in inspectable, <clears throat> and um, therefore we needed some Python infrastructure, some Python support for OSLC. And um, I will skip the next one, I think. Um, so what we are doing for our um, application servers, we are using something called Whiskey. Mario will get into some details of that. That is a Python standard for creating web application web applications and Whiskey supports composability. So you can more or less plug um, whiskey suppliers into an existing whiskey application. And so BIOSLC is designed to be a pluggable whiskey component that can be plugged into other applications. And um, then Python should support the dynamic nature of Python. So um, for those of you that are more into Java or something like that, or C-sharp, um, Python is a little bit different. So you have very little boilerplate code. Um, we we su Python supports introspection and, and these are the features we wanted to make usable with PyOSLC. And the, I think the most important point, we wanted to decouple the binding between PyOSLC and the object in the hosting application or whatever backend um, you want to support building um, a PyOSLC server based on PyOSLC to support many different use cases like um, providing OSLC services from an application like ours or simply from um, a couple of files that store some information that is relevant um, for being made available using OSLC. And um, so that's for my part. And Mario will dive into some of the details um, um, of PyOSLC. Okay. Well, uh, hello everyone. I will continue. I will talk about the previous API. I want to mention something that we have done in the, in the first version of the PyOSLC project. Uh, the previous API design, we had these uh, uh, building blocks. We use the CSV file for validating the data source. We use some other components for deploying the REST API and the OLCC API. We created this SDK for having all the classes available for the uh, OLCC resources. We implemented the integration with JAS uh, ALM. And we also use uh, this is part of the Flash REST X, the library. We use this for having the open API or Swagger UI. This is a, a block that we implemented in the first version. The first version only worked with um, just one uh, resource, which is a requirement data source. But now we uh, are working in a different way. This is a package diagram. As you can see in the peripheral, we have the libraries we use like Flask, Flask REST X for the REST API. We use Outlib for the authentication and the RDF lib and RDF lib JSON LD. This is the most important uh, element in this uh, application. We implemented the SDK in, we have, in which we have two main packages, the PyOCC package and the PyOCC OAuth for implementing the authentication. The PyOCC implements the, all the elements for the serialization, the vocabularies for OSC and the resources like service provider catalogs and so on. The other section is the, the application. We have the API and in, within the API, we have three main packages. The adapter is the main package in which we have all the endpoints implemented for, um, for requesting the information <clears throat> through the API. This is the architecture. We could see here we use Python, as we mentioned, Flask, Flask RX, and RDF. We implemented all the methods for having the capability for retrieving information from the data source and to expose this information using RDF uh, to the client. 
This is the main uh, uh, structure, or we follow this uh, specification of the OSC for having all these elements available, one service provider catalog, the service provider, and through the service provider to have access to the information using all the services like the query capability and so on. This was uh, the first version of the uh, SDK. Our new API design, we, uh, Frank, his team and, and I were talking about how to implement this to decouple the application and to be able to use this application with an existing uh, uh, REST API. They already have this EE application and they are with GitHub call uh, compatible. We could, or we uh, want to have the OSC API available for add to this other application to expose the information using the RDF representation. This is the SDK, the old uh, package uh, structure is only to have the SDK. The, the new package we created the PyOC server, which will be uh, the responsible to deploy the server to manage all the requests and to generate the information in the RDF representation. Using this new structure, we could then uh, in the future add the PyOCC client for other purposes. Here I'm showing this uh, to have the idea that, well, most of us know that REST API use JSON and XML and implements all the resource methods to interact with the data source. And in the other hand, OLCC API have or has the capability to expose this information using RDF and for using the linked data model for having this kind of interaction with other uh, application. Using these two uh, elements, API in one side and the OSC API in the other side, we could create uh, what we call it the OSC enabled application. This OSC enabled application will be available for having the REST API, the endpoints of the REST API and the endpoints of the PyOSC or the OSC specification to access to the information. This is an example of how uh, we implemented this. We have the REST API, the existing REST API, then we could import from PyOSC server the OSC application, instantiate it, and then initialize the adapters. I will mention the adapters in the next uh, slides. This is the thing that we need to do. And then the collable, which is the WSGI uh, compatible uh, or implementation uh, to run this application. And then we could access to the REST endpoints and the OSC endpoints. <clears throat> in the new uh, API design, we have two options for deployment. As you can see, uh, we have the existing REST API and we could add the PyOCC API within it and then run this application through the WSGI uh, collable from the existing REST API. Or in the other hand, we could create a OCC API from scratch and run it because it's a WSGI uh, compatible uh, application and we could include this in, into a web server for running. This is another example. This is the example I'm using here. I'm creating the OSC enable, which is the uh, existing API. And then I'm running in the other, in the uh, image below, uh, this application in the, in the web server. Uh, we are mentioned Whiskey. Uh, most of us know that Whiskey is a set of a specification uh, that define the rules on how the application or the web application will interact with this server. We need to define some elements. Uh, the whiskey will control or will manage all the variables or the environment variables and the callable uh, functions to run or to exchange information from uh, the application and the server. Uh, the whiskey implementation is something similar that we know in, in Java um, as the Java server API. What we do uh, in the new API is to create this whiskey server or whiskey collable uh, implementation to have the capability to, as Frank mentioned, uh, to plug the OLCC API within a existing REST API or to just run this application from, from the web server. 
This is an, a diagram on how we receive the request. Um, the whiskey server will receive the, risk, the request. Then this will delegate this information to the whiskey framework. This could be a OSC enabled application or it could be the PyOSC server directly. This is the way that we are managing this implementation for having both uh, uh, ways to deploy the application. We are using Barksoid, which is a library for defining all the routes for saying what is the routes for the service provider catalog or the services. And we are using this for specifying the, the URL for all the resources. I will show an example in the next slide, but what I want to say here is that these, all these uh, routes, we could define them in the moment that we are in, in instantiating, sorry, the adapters. <clears throat> here we have the main concept, which is the service resource adapter. We are using this service resource adapter as a meta class in which we define all the methods that it supported for the OLCC specification. You could see here the query capability, the creation factory, and so on. These methods will be uh, defined in this meta class and the adapters, which is the implementation of these methods of, of this class, sorry, will implement these methods for saying to the OLCC API that that we want to expose those elements through those methods. In this uh, uh, class, we could have the methods that we are or we have in the specification. And in the implementation, we could define if we want to implement them or not. I will show this in the next slide, uh, in, in the next demo slide. The benefit of using the service resource adapter is that in this way, the developer doesn't need to take care about the implementation of the OLCC method. This would be something that the adapter or the service resource adapter will implement. The developer on, only needs to be focused in the implementation of the method to get or to interact with the data source or the resources in the data source. We only need to define which methods wants to uh, we want to implement and then focus in the implementation of or the way to get the information from that. The resource adapter will manage all the methods, sorry, all the elements in the headers, will uh, negotiate the, he the headers, also will manage the transformation of the Python objects to the RDF representation, and the developers only need to call these methods for, for the transformation. We could see here, for example, now we are adding some new elements or some new components. In the previous uh, version of the API, we only work in, on implementing the requirement uh, resource. In this case, we could have a uh, set of domain specific resources. We could manage requirement, products, document, test case, or whatever. We just need to define the class, to define the attributes, and then to be able to use th those uh, resources in the implementation of the adapter. In this uh, example, we are only defining a class for requirement. We define these attributes that would be uh, the attributes that we want to expose through this uh, OLCC endpoint. <clears throat> the resource adapter, is the implementation, as I mentioned before, uh, of the res service resource adapter. In this class implemented by the developer, the developer should uh, overwrite the methods that he wants to use for the implementation of the OLCC API. In this case, for example, I'm showing here the get resource method that is the implemented. In this case, uh, I have another slide showing the, the, the demo. Here I have the requirement adapter and extended the service resource adapter. And here uh, you could see that I'm showing some other um, uh, attributes like domain, types, items, and mapping. And uh, below you could see the methods that I'm implementing for this adapter, the query capability and creation factory. Once we implemented the adapter class, 
then we could instantiate this adapter and add this adapter to the OLCC application that we defined previously. This, the mapping RTF for the adapter is something necessary also. We could define here the map of the attributes that we are using in our Python objects and the match that it, it, it should have in the OLCC specification. In here, we could define this mapping for using this mapping in the transformation of the Python object to the, to the RDF representation. This is an example also. We use this in the adapter for having this information. One thing that I have to mention here is that once we define the mapping of the attributes, we don't need to take care of how this uh, mapping should work. This is something that the OCC API will do uh, for us. He, uh, the API will take this information and transform the elements or the objects into the RDF. <clears throat> this is the list of the capabilities that an adapter could have. Uh, we could see once we add an adapter to the API, we will have a service provider. For each adapter, we will have one service provider. And if the adapter implements the methods, we will have those services available in the service provider. Here, uh, I mentioned before, this is an example. I'm using the, the query capability and creation factory for these methods and the get resource, which is the, uh, to get the resource uh, specifically. And this is the result. In this case, uh, I have the catalog. I could uh, request the catalog. My example or my demo only add one uh, adapter, but in this example, you could see that we could have different adapters added to the API. And for each adapter, we have one service provider here. The service provider implemented in our uh, example has the query capability creation factory. And we could see here the query capability and creation factory services available for uh, interact with the uh, application. And using the, the query capability, as you know, we could send the request and we could have the information available for receiving the, the resources. Um, this implements also the paging uh, and the uh, query parameters for selecting information. We delegate these uh, parameters to the uh, implementer, in this case, the adapter, and the developer should receive this parameter for um, retrieving the information during the uh, selection of the attributes and so on. And our conclusion is that in this case, PyOCC support uh, the development of OSC API for any domain specific resource. Developers only need to focus in the implementation of their methods. They don't need to, uh, to know much about OSC. They need only to have basic understanding. And well, uh, developers, don't need to modify or don't need to take care about the implementation of the OLCC endpoints. They only need to take care about their methods, how to interact from the adapter to the data source. And that's all for me. Thank you.